in undertaking any study of the Dune series from a thematic point of view, it is best to commence with one of the themes that for want of a better term, permeates the entire series. This is primarily for the reason that while some of the dominant themes perpetuate throughout the series, others peter out to a certain extent, and while not ignored altogether, lose a sense of their prominence as the narrative continues. This is not hard to comprehend when we look at the enormity of the Dune series, both in terms of its actual length, and the sheer epic scale of the story, which takes place over several thousand years. In saying that evolution as a theme permeates the Dune series, I mean that it is a theme strong at both the beginning and the end of the series, and maintains within it the details of the other major focal points of the story. Some of the major themes do diminish as the narrative progresses, but Herbert ensures evolution remains a constant throughout the series. Evolution, including eugenics and genetic engineering, represent one of the most detailed and lengthy thematic explorations in the Dune series, and although tertiary to the other dominant themes, it is to a degree much more expansive in scope. As mentioned earlier, Frank Herbert's themes are complexly intertwined like the threads in an intricately woven tapestry, and are difficult to tease apart upon individual examination. Towards that understanding, it must be noted that the theme of evolution and genetic engineering does much to inform Herbert's approach to his superhuman protagonists, themselves products of evolution through either artificial selection based breeding programs, genetic engineering, or forced evolution by symbiotic mutation. In knowing this, then we can realise how evolution and genetic engineering as a theme shapes and helps realise the first of Herbert's two major themes in Dune, that of the catastrophic hero and the periodic messianic impulses that overtake society. Evolution and genetic engineering are also viewed as systems and tools of the long term expansion and survival of the human species. In his provision of the second of the Dune series major themes, that of ecology, evolution as a system for the development and survival of life is in turn influenced by the ecology of a given environment, and vice versa. Collectively, all three of these themes are seen most importantly by Herbert as systems utilised by human beings. The importance of understanding systemic thinking, especially in a long term scale, is crucial in realising how these themes interact and weave together in the narrative of the Dune series. Systemic thinking is similarly important to Herbert in presenting ecology as a subject for investigation, especially due to the differences he perceived between Western man and tribal societies. Likewise it is crucial in understanding the socio-political trappings that develop around charismatic leadership. Herbert's examination of evolution and genetics fundamentally adds to his speculation on each of these complementing topics. As evolution and genetics are themes from subject matter in science and science fiction from the mid to late 19th century onwards, Herbert's discourse on these topics is in itself an evolutionary one that we are able to witness for ourselves as the millennia slip by within the narrative of the Dune universe. Frank Herbert's examination of evolution and genetics in the Dune series came from his desire to subvert the contemporary mode of science fiction as it was in its state of stagnancy during the 1950s and 1960s. Primarily, this desire was based on two approaches. Firstly, to turn the tide against the typical nature of science fiction heroes, especially the Van Vautian hero that had been recurring since the 40s. This hero was often a mutation of baseline humans, modelled on the concept of an evolved ubermensch. This was in its essence an individual protagonist who was usually set apart from the rest of humanity, often possessing unique powers and abilities granted to them because of their evolutionary differences. Characters from science fiction stories that featured supermen were a favourite of John W. Campbell, the editor of Amazing Stories and Analogue. On the premise that science fiction stories were the kind of stories that science fiction editors buy, many of the works featuring in these publications began to follow this trend. Secondly, as this trend was tied to the future evolution of man, and because science fiction seemed to becoming more a literature that was viewed as being in the gutter, Herbert wanted to write a work of some length that was more aspiring towards quality literature than pulp fiction. 
This was also in part to do with the fact that Herbert often had trouble writing shorter works, his stories often going over the prescribed word length for publication. In having evolution combined with the dangers of society's messianic impulses towards unusual and highly charismatic leaders, it was towards Victorian science fiction that he turned for his inspiration with these themes, and in particular to the works of Samuel Butler, and to a lesser extent, Edward Bulwer Lytton. Notably, it was this kind of fiction that Herbert favoured in his youth, before proudly declaring his intentions of being an author to his bemused family. Evolution has been a popular topic for consideration from the earliest forms of the genre, and can be found in many a work which existed prior to the great spur of the subject, namely, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, by Charles Darwin. Brian Stableford's entry on evolution in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, 2nd edition, sums up the relationship between science fiction and evolutionary theory quite elegantly when he states that, there is inevitably an intimate connection between the development of evolutionary philosophy and the history of science fiction. In a culture without an evolutionary philosophy, most of the kinds of fiction we categorise as science fiction could not develop. While there is an abundance of work within the genre exploring issues relating to evolution, Stableford is not so optimistic when discussing genetics within science fiction, if not self-promoting. Stableford's entry on genetic engineering in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction describes the genre's forays into the subject as showing little that is championing the cause of genetic engineering. Although Stableford is to a degree correct here, when he describes the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program of Dune as a pedestrian affair of long-range eugenics, he repeats the common mistake of only looking at the first part of Herbert's series. Dune may focus almost entirely on the results of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, but in ignoring the other books in the series, one fails to notice the many other concepts of genetic engineering and associated technologies as they evolve throughout the series. Genetic engineering is viewed as the language of God by the Bene Tleilax, and the nature of their own patriarchal society is crucial to the development of the story. It is just unfortunate that the only part of the series that they do not appear in is Dune itself. Stableford ends his article in the Encyclopedia by demonstrating that the potential for science fiction stories that focus on genetic engineering is far from being realised. It cannot be said that science fiction writers have as yet explored the real potential which genetic engineering technologies hold for the radical remaking of the human world, but a beginning of sorts is made by the speculative future history, The Third Millennium, by Brian Stapleford and David Langford, and by Stapleford's various spin-off short stories, some of which are collected in Sexual Chemistry, Tales of the Genetic Revolution. It is because of the verisimilitude that the themes of evolution and genetic engineering lend to the historical backdrop of the Dune universe that Frank Herbert's notions and concepts of this subject matter bolster and reinforce the other predominant themes in the Dune series. Herbert's approach to evolution, as we shall see, is not just presented to the reader as a singular path that humanity may take down its journey of development as a species, but rather as something altogether more chaotic and complex. This is often a trend in science fiction literature that tends to explore either a particularly single viewpoint, for example the Martians in The War of the Worlds, or occasionally for the benefit of contrast and comparison, a dual presentation of mankind's evolution, such as the Eloi and Morlocks in H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. The epic scale of the Dune series instead provides Herbert with the scope to explore many different avenues of evolution, while also giving him the room to show it as a process which systems, technology and human conventions continue to alter and adapt over a lengthy timescale. At the heart of the Dune universe, in its cultural, social, religious, technological and ultimately evolutionary spheres, is the event known as the Butlerian Jihad. The Butlerian Jihad functions in the same manner to Dune as J.R.R. Tolkien's History and Languages of Middle-earth do so with The Lord of the Rings. That is, it lends to the narrative a believable and well-realised historical background that in turn permeates effortlessly into the narrative of the story's present day. The Butlerian Jihad is a long war between humanity and thinking machines. 
One of the results of this holy war is the development of the commission of ecumenical translators, which simultaneously destroys some religions that are resistant to its edicts, whilst merging and integrating others that are more open and susceptible. This action places humanity in a downward atavistic spiral through its prohibition of intelligent machines, or artificial intelligence. The Butlerian Jihad creates a universe that exhibits many qualities of a feudal society where people fear what machines may become. As the Butlerian Jihad retards the development and ultimately evolution of thinking machines, it serves to spur human evolution down differing paths. Many of the ideas presented through the Butlerian Jihad show Herbert understanding and referencing quite deliberately more traditional and earlier works of science fiction, and especially the ideas of Samuel Butler, the Victorian iconoclast and novelist who first presented many of the notions that are extrapolated in Dune. Butler's fame was in part for his novels, especially the posthumously published The Way of All Flesh, but also as an iconoclast he amusingly snapped at the inadequacies of Victorian society. However, Butler is also well remembered for his very public if rather one-sided spat with Charles Darwin over his ideas on evolution and the origin of species, despite having been an earlier supporter of Darwin. Samuel Butler's Erewhon, published in 1872, is a pastoral utopia set in New Zealand and is paramount to understanding many of the underlying concepts and dominant themes in Dune. It is a novel of great significance, not just during the early years of its initial anonymous publication, but remains so today with the study of science fiction as a genre. Erewhon presents itself as a satire that looks into both Victorian values and the storm that brewed in that society in the following years after the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859. It is perhaps not only the first book to explore the concept of machine evolution in light of the theory of natural selection and all that it implied to Victorian society, but is also probably the first work to speculate on the nature of artificial intelligence and technological singularity. These are themes that have come to dominate science fiction in recent years, especially within the realms of cyberpunk and the recently re-emerged and reinvigorated space operas popularised by the likes of Ian M. Banks, Alistair Reynolds and Dan Simmons. The Butlerian Jihad represents a turning point in history for Herbert's Dune universe, and is the palette from which he was able to draw so many of his memorable characters and institutions. It underlies two of Herbert's key warnings in the novels, firstly that of a society that blindly follows leaders, and secondly the inherent dependencies that human beings develop, specifically centred on the reliance of machines and technology. Timothy O'Reilly, in his book Frank Herbert, suggests that the Butlerian Jihad comes from a direct result of the fear of computers in our own culture, based upon an article that Frank Herbert had written from the San Francisco Examiner in 1968. This premise is incorrect however, although the fear of machines progressing beyond human beings in an evolutionary advancement was the key idea presented in Butler's Erewhon. Herbert himself was interested in computers and used them in his work as a writer, at one point investing money into the development of a new computer system in 1979. The events of the Dune series begin in the year 10191 after Guild, approximately the year 24191 AD. The Butlerian Jihad itself commences in 201 BG, which is before the Guild, and finally ends in the year 108 BG. This period of history in the Dune universe is a crucible focused around the oppression of humanity by thinking machines, which spurs a revolt and ultimately a jihad to eliminate these machines completely. It is in the upheaval that is created in the aftermath of humanity's victory that causes a fundamental transformation to every single aspect of the human universe. Then came the Butlerian Jihad, two generations of chaos. The god of machine logic was overthrown among the masses and a new concept was raised. Man may not be replaced. We learn a great deal of the Butlerian Jihad from the second appendix of Dune, entitled The Religion of Dune. The purpose of this appendix is to highlight the dominant religious systems in the Imperium and illustrate if there is any similarity to the religion of Moadib when he sits upon the Golden Throne. 
Prior to the ascent of Paul Moadib Betrides on Arrakis, and his rise to the position of Emperor and Messiah of the Fremen, the religious beliefs of the Dune universe are shaped by a number of forces. Herbert tells us in the second appendix that these are as follows. 1. The Orange Catholic Bible produced at the Commission of Ecumenical Translators, the CET. 2. The Bene Gesserit. 3. The ruling classes of the Landsrad and the Guild, who are essentially agnostic in truth but use religion as a tool of statecraft. 4. The ancient teachings which include Buddhist-Islamic teachings, Hinduism, the Zen Sunni wanderers variants of Islam, a variety of Eastern faiths, and the Butlerian Jihad itself. 5. Space travel, possibly the most important of all. As a result of the Butlerian Jihad, Herbert tells us that two major developments took place within the religious spheres of the Empire. The first of these was the realisation that all religions had at least one common commandment, Thou shalt not disfigure the soul. The second of these developments was the commission of ecumenical translators. The purpose of the CET was essentially to examine the nature of all the faiths in the empire, and produce a common work of religious beliefs, and after seven years of work, they eventually produced what was to become the Orange Catholic Bible, known as the OC Bible. Although the result was the OC Bible, the goal was to remove a primary weapon from the hands of disputant religions, that weapon, the claim to possession of the one and only revelation. The attempt to create an all permeating universal religion caused huge upheaval and many deaths, but eventually the CET produced the OC Bible, which is described at one point as a work created by the Hubris of Reason. During these periods of transition, it is the Guild, the Landsrad, and the Bene Gesserit who help hold the fabric of society together. We occasionally learn of the religious attitudes developed by the CET through the Bene Gesserit, who often take great affront if they suspect certain aspects of the sacred commandments towards technological and mechanical prohibition are being violated. At the beginning of June, when Paul is first tested with the Gom Jabbar by the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohim, he asks her why she tests for humans, her reply being, to set you free. The purpose of this test is to create a crisis point, a gateway where one may either pass and survive, or fail and die. The very essence of this test is not just the survival of the fittest, but also to determine if the person is a human, and more specifically, not an animal. Although the Reverend Mother is testing Paul to see if he is the Kwisatz Haderach, in a moment of clarity, he asks her if the Kwisatz Haderach is a human Gom Jabbar. The crisis point of the Gom Jabbar is a frequent spur of evolutionary advancement in the Dune series, and is a key concept in reawakening the genetic memories of the Tleilaxu Golas, as we shall see later. Once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free, but that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a man's mind, Paul quoted. Right out of the Butlerian Jihad and the Orange Catholic Bible, she said, but what the OC Bible should have said is, Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. Have you studied the Mentat in your service? I've studied with Thufir Howard. The Great Revolt took away a crutch, she said. It forced human minds to develop. Schools were started to train human talents. Bene Gesserit schools? She nodded. We have two chief survivors of those ancient schools, the Bene Gesserit and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasises almost pure mathematics. Bene Gesserit performs another function. Politics, he said. Kulwahad, the old woman said. The Butlerian Jihad, as we have seen, creates fundamental changes in the Dune series that last for several thousand years, the consequences of which change society and the way human beings think in terms of their evolution and their place in the universe. The mental physical schools that developed out of the Great Revolt, such as the Bene Gesserit, politics, and the Spacing Guild, mathematics, are created to remove humanity's reliance on intelligent machinery and advanced technology. The doctrine that emerges from the CET 
serves to cease the divisions amongst human beings created by the vast range of religions in the Imperium, while simultaneously creating a common consensus regarding artificial intelligence and advanced technology, which equates such things with holy commandments and sin. The Butlerian Jihad's influence throughout the Imperium is paramount, and the consequences that it creates are obvious and far-reaching. The Butlerian Jihad itself represents not just an influence on Frank Herbert's most famous creation, but also created a platform for the author to extrapolate some very fascinating ideas from post-Darwinian science fiction, and in particular Samuel Butler's Erewhon. Both works are products of their times, and illustrate the fascination that science fiction has with the subject of evolution.